Everyone has a story. Mine starts on October 31st, 2007, when I was born in Wisconsin. Shortly after, my family moved to California, where I've lived my whole life. Spending time with my cousins, playing with my dog Ellie, going to the beach, and traveling with my family are my favorite things to do. I also love watching sports games with my dad. Our favorite teams are the Green Bay Packers and the Los Angeles Lakers. I just finished my freshman year of high school, and a typical day for me looks like any regular day for a student my age. After I wake up, get ready, and go to school, I come home and study until I get ready to go to tennis practice. A newer passion of mine is debate. During the school year, I visit different colleges for tournaments, and this past year I won three junior varsity ones with my debate partner. These things may not seem any different from the activities that you like to do, but what I'm about to tell you makes me different. Hi, my name is Gia, and I'm 15 years old. When I was 14 and in 8th grade, I loved to do things that any kid my age liked to do. My favorite way to spend my free time over the weekends was hang out with my cousins and play board games or listen to music with them. I also loved going for long hikes with my mom and play golf with my dad and sister. At school, my favorite subjects were science and math, and I had a strong aspiration to become a doctor just like my dad. I never expected something to divert me off of this path, but in December of 2021, I was diagnosed with a ruptured brain aneurysm. I can remember the day it happened on December 7th. It was a normal school day for me, and after my mom picked me up, I was complaining about some dumb math tests that seemed to be quite tough for me. I just couldn't wait to go home and take a nap before tennis practice. Later that night, around 8 p.m., I came home and started to eat dinner with my sister. I then took a shower, and around five minutes in, I felt this loud ringing sound in the back of my ears and a strong pressure in the back of my head. After that, the worst headache I'd ever experienced in my life quickly followed, and it was easily the worst pain I'd ever been through. The only thoughts pacing through my mind were, I need to get to my parents. The morning after my headache, my mom took me into the Children's Hospital in Orange County, and I remember feeling weak and could barely walk in on my own. After taking a COVID test, because all of this happened during the pandemic, the doctors gave me a couple blood tests and did a CT scan of my brain. Within the hour, the doctors came back and told us that the scan and other tests have come back negative and that I most likely had a migraine. So they gave me a concoction of drugs called the migraine cocktail, which temporarily masked my pain and I was sent home. Hi, I'm Gia's mom. And I'm Gia's dad. And I'm also a physician at St. Joseph and Children's Hospital, Orange County in California. I wanted to tell you a little bit about what happened on the day when Gia's aneurysm ruptured. All of a sudden, I see Gia running into my bedroom uh, her hair is still wet from the shower, and uh, she's just holding her head up, hyperventilating at this point, and she couldn't get any words out, and she said, Mom, take me to the hospital. Something's not right. And I looked at her puzzled, and I wasn't sure what was going on at that point. Um, but shortly after, she just started throwing up, and I you know, took her to the shower. I started cleaning up, and while I was cleaning her up, and um, you know, where she threw up, I called my husband to tell him what had happened. And he said that, um, you know, keep her comfortable until he got home. And he will, you know, talk to Gia. And at that point, I'm thinking norovirus, something that she picked up from school, uh, a stomach bug of some kind. Um, and shortly after, I think it was around 1030 that Kishan got home. I come home. And the first thing I do is to go assess Gia. I asked her a bunch of questions, what's going on. She tells me my head hurts, my neck hurts, and I'm throwing up. I can't keep anything down. And the headache part kind of puzzled me initially. And I was thinking that's not really normal unless you're dehydrated. So first thing in my head is thinking, how can I get fluids in Gia? Um, I gave her an anti-nausea medication first because we had that. In she couldn't house. hold that in her stomach. But nothing was staying in. I also gave her Tylenol for her headache pain that she had. Yeah. And she's just not able to keep anything down. So. She was in a lot of Eventually, pain. I knew we would have to go to the ER. Yeah. And the uh, problem was that there was COVID going around. So going to the ER was not an easy task at the time. And it risked additional exposure for my daughter. So I was trying to somehow get fluids in her. I kept, told her to drink one ounce at a time, very slowly. But every every 30 minutes, she'd just throw up everything that would go in. So yeah. at that point, me and my wife decided we need to take her in. So you went to work. At, I went to work in the morning. And I took Gia to Chalk, and uh, we got admitted to Chalk. Uh, immediately, they did 
bunch of blood tests, COVID testing, and um, they also did a CT scan for Gia. Pretty much the entire time we're there, Gia is either sleeping or just in and out of, um, you know, just out of it. Uh, we were released from the hospital and the hospital said to keep her comfortable at home, give her Advil. I was at home for three days after the hospital diagnosed me with a migraine, wondering if I'd have to live with headaches like these for the rest of my life. My neck started to become stiff to the point where I couldn't nod or shake my head. I was also sensitive to things like light and sound because they would aggravate the headache even more. And I couldn't even listen to the sound of my mom doing dishes in the morning because the sound of the running water would be amplified in my head, causing even more pain. Hi, my name is Michael Mahonen. I am a pediatric neurosurgeon at Children's Hospital of Orange County. I've been at Children's Hospital of Orange County for almost 30 years. So when you look at the big picture of aneurysms, most of these occur in adults. This is not a disease that we typically think of as childhood. In fact, there's no subspecialty training for treating children with aneurysms. And the reason it's difficult is, one, it's rare. And secondly, because it's rare, not many people get to see it. I see a new aneurysm probably one every year, one every two years. It's that uncommon, and we're a very large tertiary center that takes care of a population of over three million people in Orange County. And it's super rare that we see aneurysms that come in. And it's even more rare, your presentation, that you see an aneurysm that comes in that has ruptured already. So it's because it's a rarity of a disease, when you go to an emergency room with a headache, they think you have a headache. Well, what's a headache? A migraine headache is far and above the most common cause of a headache. So paring this down is what it takes to try to diagnose an aneurysm that has ruptured. So if someone experiences a severe headache, um, do you have any specific recommendations for screening if they had a similar situation to me where the CT scan appeared negative along with other tests? So you had a very unique case. If you look at I would venture to say that day alone in the emergency room, they probably saw 20 children with headaches. And you're going to be the only one that had a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a ruptured uh, aneurysm. And that's on a daily basis. They'll see that many children that come in with headaches. And that's what makes the workup extremely difficult. But when you really look into it and clean out the uh, chaff in your history, you can see that you had what we call a thunderclap headache. It was just like that. And migraine headaches don't occur like that. You might have been on your computer for a long time and you start getting a headache back there, the muscles pulled. So it's looking at the situation, trying to figure out, all right, this headache's a little bit unique uh, because it came on suddenly. And the key is taking the history more than anything. So the first thing they do is they do a cask, and well, yours was negative. It was negative because the quantity of blood that had leaked out of the aneurysm, fortunately for you, was very little. So you might have had a thimble full of blood that got around the brain. Mm -hmm. But that thimble full of blood is enough to give you the worst headache of your life, which I think you would agree was what you had. Yeah. It's enough to make you vomit. It's enough to make you nauseated for days. Mm -hmm. And that's why your symptoms didn't go away fast, because of that thimble amount of blood that was... Uh, touching the surface of the brain and the brain stem. Are there any other symptoms that these doctors should be aware of besides the worst headache of your life? So it takes days for the blood to go away if it's ruptured. The aneurysm itself is not what gives you the headache. Your aneurysm may have been as big as the tip of your finger, probably even smaller than that. It's the blood that leaked out. So you're looking for not symptomology. Well, I've seen aneurysms so big it can give you a a nerve palsy where the eye won't open, for example. That's very rare. So you're really looking at the headache and trying to decide, is this headache pattern irregular if it doesn't fit with a migraine pattern? Got it. So when focusing more on pediatric patients, what makes certain individuals more likely to develop brain aneurysms? Is there anything in specific? There's multiple reasons uh, pediatric patients would be more prone to aneurysms. For example, if you have certain syndromes, so uh, any syndrome where your collagen, your body might be weak. For example, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, where they have hypermobility of the joints, the collagen is weak, but the collagen is also weak in the lining of the blood vessels. So it's mostly collagen vascular diseases that you're looking at, people that are more prone. That all being said, most aneurysms are not associated with that. So most people that get an aneurysm, they just got an aneurysm and 
like I was telling you earlier, it's about one out of 20 people. So one out of the 20 people in this office has an aneurysm probably besides you. It's, it's that common of disorder, and we don't scan it or screen everybody necessarily. Um, but it goes back, who do we want to screen, who do you don't? I think if there's a family history, uh, if the headache pattern is irregular and just persisting, then it's worth doing the MR angiogram as a screening tool. I was just hoping that in the next 24 hours you would get better. And it didn't get better. I think it was Saturday morning that I took my younger daughter to a debate tournament, and um, my husband was home with Gia. And at that point, you made the decision that we need to I would ask get an Gia MRI pretty scan. Pretty much, you know, every every day, every few hours, you know, we waited about three days exactly. And I'm like, "How's your headache on the third day exactly at 72 hours?" And Gia says, "Dad, my neck's getting stiffer." This headache is so bad. If I have to live with this, I'd rather not live. At that point, I knew something had to be done. Um, That's when we took her back to Chalk Hospital and asked for we, that MRI. We got scan. an MRI at Chalk Hospital MRI, and immediately they diagnosed her with uh, brain aneurysm. I remember my dad and I waiting in the lobby of Chalk after my MRI when he got a call from the radiology department. Afterwards, when I asked him what was wrong, he told me that, the scan showed an 8 by 4 millimeter aneurysm, and I was like, well, what's an aneurysm? My name is Michael Lawton. I'm president and CEO of Barrow Neurological Institute, which is where we are. This is my CEO corner office, and welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, could you provide a general overview of what a brain aneurysm is and why it's such a critical health concern? Yes. Uh, a brain aneurysm is a weak spot on an artery. Um, arteries are like cylinders, and... Um, they branch into different um, uh, limbs, and right at these branch points, the flow can weaken the wall, and it starts as a weak spot. Uh, it turns into a bulge, and then it uh, grows into a sac, and very much like a balloon that's slowly inflating, um, that sac enlarges, um, the walls get thin, and an aneurysm can get to the point where it bursts. So in a sense, an aneurysm is harmless, but because they go on to rupture and bleed, they can be very dangerous and life-threatening. Got it. What's your experience in treating these ruptured brain aneurysms? 5,205 cases. So um, that's the number of aneurysms that I've treated in my career. And I'm a little obsessive. I, I count all of them as I do them. And uh, it's kind of like um, my equivalent of um, a baseball player counting his, his home runs, but uh, that's where I stand. So what are some of the warning signs and symptoms that individuals should be aware of when it comes to brain aneurysms? So brain, brain aneurysms um, are quiet. You never know you have them. Um, if they're there, um, they can just um, sit there and the arteries can do what they need to do, which is to deliver blood flow, and you'll never know you have it. Um, so the warning sign is only when it ruptures. And so when it pops or bursts, then you get a sudden severe headache. It's explosive. It's instantaneous, and it's um, the worst headache that you've ever had. In fact, that's what people use these those words to describe it. Um, we, we um, you know, you felt it. Um, you know, if I ask patients to rate the pain on a scale from one to ten, they'll always say eleven or twelve, you know, because it's off the scale. Uh, it's unlike any other headache. So uh, that's the warning sign. Now, um, there are some aneurysms that will grow and get big, um, and as they do that, they can pinch a nerve. So the most common nerve that gets pinched is the oculomotor nerve, which is the eye uh, movement nerve. So it moves your eye in the socket, and um, if an aneurysm is growing and it pinches the nerve, you can get double vision. Your eye can be uh, kind of turned outward and down, and that can be a warning sign. Um, there are other aneurysms that can pinch other nerves, like um, your optic nerve can get pinched. You can get a blind spot. Um, you can also um, you know, uh, have a stroke from an aneurysm if it has clot on the inside. But um, those are really rare. So it's really just a sudden headache. Are there any risk factors that can make someone more prone to developing an aneurysm? Smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, a family history and some genetics. Um, and. Uh, Sometimes tra trauma can cause aneurysms. So those are the main causes. But um, I, I would say that um, most of the time, um, you know, uh, just uh, bad luck. You know, sometimes it's the way that the 
arteries are assembled and it's the twists and turns that cause these blood flows to be erosive. Um, I would also say, you know, being a woman is a risk factor. Women get uh, aneurysms about twice more than men. Why is that? Uh, not entirely clear. It probably has something to do with um, the uh, female hormones that affect the arteries and also um, the um, changes that women undergo as they go through menopause and those hormonal environments change. If someone walked into a hospital with a bad headache, is the misdiagnosis of a brain aneurysm rupture common? It's very common. Um, headache is one of the most common diagnoses that are seen in emergency rooms. And so patients are very often told, oh, it's a migraine or it's a whatever headache, a tension headache or a cluster headache. And um, they're given a prescription for a pain reliever and sent home. They're not bleeding. They're not um, uh, debilitated uh, neurologically. Uh, so, you know, they're dismissed. And um, in, the, in the rush of an ER, um, an aneurysm that's had what we call a sentinel hemorrhage can be missed. Th those little warning leaks can be critical. And um, uh, if you miss a warning leak, which is a little leakage from the aneurysm, they very often uh, go on to a full-blown rupture, which can be life-ending. And so it's a huge mistake. Are there any screening recommendations that you have that can potentially combat misdiagnosis? Well, um, the best screening thing is just a good history. If a patient can talk to you and they give you the uh, telltale features of a subarachnoid hemorrhage or a ruptured aneurysm, which is that explosive headache, worst headache of their life, and um, sudden onset, like instantaneous, it's done. You know, you know it's aneurysm until proven otherwise. Everything started to move pretty fast after the lumbar puncture officially diagnosed me with a brain aneurysm. And then my parents told me that they were going to try to get me to the UCLA hospital, to a doctor that specialized in aneurysm treatment. At this point, the headache hadn't improved at all, and I was still in a lot of pain. And a transport nurse walked into our room and looked at my parents and I and said, OK, the helicopter is ready. And I was absolutely shocked. I looked over at my dad and I was like, they're bringing me to UCLA in a helicopter or what? The helicopter ride was noisy and the sound of the wind created this echo in my head that wouldn't go away despite the fact I was wearing three layers of headphones. After 18 minutes, once I got to UCLA, the transport nurses brought me to this room where I met my mom shortly after, and that's when we began the search for my doctor. That same night, my dad explained to me that this interventional neuroradiologist named Dr. Gary Duckweiler would perform a coiling procedure on me, and that's when I asked right away, What's a coiling procedure? So this is Dr. Gary Duckweiler. Thank you for taking your time to help us with this. Would you like to explain what you treat and specialize in as a medical professional? Sure. Uh, so the field I'm in is, is um, interventional neuro. Okay, there are many pathways to it. I took a pathway through radiology, and so my specific title is interventional neuroradiologist. Um, the field is primarily uh, doing treatments through the vascular system. So you enter into the blood vessels, guide small uh, devices, catheters, under x-ray guidance through the blood vessels to the site uh, where you need to do your treatment and uh, use different devices for treatment. So blood vessels, if they're blocked, like with an acute stroke, with a blood clot, we have devices to go in and aspirate or, or entrap those clots and pull them out. And for things that bleed, like aneurysms, we have uh, tools to block the vessels or block the aneurysm or block whatever's bleeding. So could you talk a little bit more about coiling and how that's a procedure commonly used to treat brain aneurysms? Right. So, so for decades, the primary treatment for uh, brain aneurysms was open surgery. So going through the skull, through the brain, down to the vessel, and then applying a small clip to pinch off the, the bulging part of the artery, the aneurysm. Um, uh, one of my ex-compatriots, uh, Dr. Guido Guglielmi, an Italian neurosurgeon, uh, came from Italy with the idea to um, improve techniques to do it less invasively and from the inside of the artery. And so he developed these uh, small detachable coils along with uh, uh, another one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Fernando Venuela and um, an engineer, Ivan Spetka. And these are small, mostly platinum-based coils that are annealed around a, some sort of mandrel for a specific size and shape. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the aneurysm, you look at the size and the shape of the aneurysm, you pick the coil, which is the appropriate size, you guide it, and it's very small. Uh, 
uh, guide it through the catheter into the aneurysm. It takes its shape as it comes through the unconstricted space. And uh, then if it's in place and, and appropriately sized and doing its job, then you apply a small electric, electrical current to um, electrolytically detach the coil from that carrier wire. And then you put in several sort of like Russian nesting dolls to uh, fill up the aneurysm to buttress the, the, the burst uh, wall and prevent it from rebleeding. And take care of it that way. Got it. So how long do these procedures typically last? It depends on the size and of the aneurysm and the complexity of the navigation and um, uh, complexity of getting the coils to set right. But the uh, shortest time, uh, an hour, longest time is uh, several hours. So is coiling more common compared to other methods of treatment like clipping or flow diverting stents? Well, each one has their uh, potential benefits mm -hmm. and potential risks. So uh, an aneurysm, uh, you can imagine an aneurysm as a bulge and the connecting portion to the artery is narrowed, that's ideal to put coils in, right? But if the, if the connecting portion to the artery is quite, quite wide, it's very hard to keep the coils inside. And so then we might have to reconstruct the artery using a flow diverter, or might have to place a clip across to, to uh, connect the normal wall of the artery to the normal wall of the artery and exclude the aneurysm. So, Depends on location, anatomy, medical condition of the patient. Uh, many factors decide which one is the most appropriate for a given circumstance. The morning after my procedure, I woke up and my parents looked really worried. I asked them what the matter was and they told me that the neck of my aneurysm was too wide, so coiling was only able to solve 60% of the problem and there was still that other 40 to worry about. I could tell my parents were stressed and my dad was calling nearly every doctor he knew trying to figure out what to do next. I stayed at UCLA for a week and I had gotten really weak because I hadn't ate or drank anything. The doctors were worried that if I ate anything and threw up, then the pressure from that might cause the aneurysm to further rupture. Another thing I had to get used to in the hospital were neuro checks done by the nurses almost every hour to make sure that the rupture hadn't affected parts of my brain that controlled normal things like speech or memory. They'd ask me questions like, what's your name? Or who's the current president? How old are you? They even asked me once, who's the name of the actor that plays Iron Man? They'd also ask me to do things like wiggle my toes or hold up a certain number of fingers. The name Michael Lawton was recommended to our family a lot by a bunch of different surgeons that my dad works with who all told us that we should clip the aneurysm. I didn't really know what was going on or what that meant, but before I knew it, I was on a plane to Phoenix Children's Hospital where I would get surgery done by him on Monday morning. A clip comes in and uh, closes that aneurysm sac mechanically so that the opening into the sac is sealed shut. Um, that way blood can't get in, the aneurysm can't grow, it can't rupture, so it's safe. Um, the problem with that is you have to physically get there to apply the clip, um, which is, um, requires surgery, which is what I do. My dad and I left the UCLA hospital in an ambulance around 11.30 at night and arrived at the airport at midnight. Then we took off on a small plane and arrived at the Phoenix International Airport at around 2 in the morning. Once we arrived at the hospital, it was the first night I had gotten uninterrupted sleep. At the Phoenix Children's Hospital, I soon met Dr. Jennifer Ronecker, who answered my million questions on what was happening. She checked in with me daily regarding my pain levels, which had barely improved, and I would get these ultrasounds of my brain, which would monitor for stroke-like symptoms. At this point, I'd lost 21 pounds and struggled to walk and get out of bed. Well, I'm Jenny Ronecker. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon at the Barrow Neurological Institute at Phoenix Children's Hospital. So in your opinion, uh, what made my case different from others that you've treated or heard about? So I think maybe rather than patients that are different from who I take care of. I think the unique thing about you is that you're a kid or you were a kid when you were, uh, when you came to the hospital. So it's very uncommon for children to have pediatric or to have brain aneurysms rupture. And so I think that was one unique thing. And then at least from my perspective, because I take care of kids with vascular abnormalities, the aneurysm part was the unique thing about you. Uh, what makes brain aneurysm such a threatening condition? So back in the day, there were most patients didn't even make it to the hospital in time because if you think about it, you have this like ticking time bomb in your brain and if it ruptures, it bleeds, all of a sudden the blood that's supposed to be pumping oxygen to your brain is now just going into a space where it's not supposed to be, then either you run out of space and you have increased pressure in your brain or you're not oxygenating the rest of your brain and that can cause strokes and it can cause, I mean, they, they say that it's the worst headache of your life, um, but patients, they, they become unconscious very quickly a lot of times. And so 
it can be very scary. And if you don't make it to the hospital because you can't breathe on your own or you're not awake, then, then that's it. Got it. So why do you believe that it's crucial that aneurysms are treated before they rupture? Like, why is prevention so important? So the, the mortality rate for ruptured aneurysms is very high. And we used to say that a third of patients don't make it to the hospital. A third of patients have a severe disability and a third of patients end up being okay. So if we can treat and you know treat that brain aneurysm before 66% of patients are going to be disabled or dead, we can really make a difference. Got it. Um, so how do pediatric symptoms differ from what adults might um, have? Sometimes. Or? I mean, I think for little kids, they are not able to say what they're experiencing. So they just might become unconscious or they might have a seizure mm -hmm. versus adults. They are doing something like they're working out or something like that. And they have a sudden onset of the worst headache of their life. So they're much more or, or and older kids like you were, too. They're much more vocal about what they're experiencing versus little kids. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that sometimes the littler kids can present with mass effect from the brain aneurysm. So they can be so large that they're pushing on important structures of the brain and they can have different symptoms based on that, okay. which wouldn't necessarily be a ruptured aneurysm. Got it. Um, is it possible for an aneurysm to rupture through a sports injury or maybe falling with some sort of head trauma? And how often do you see cases like this? Less likely, but depending on the pattern of the bleeding that we see on the CAT scan, we could be more suspicious that it could have been the brain aneurysm. Okay. So there's certain situations where let's say like a kid was riding their bike and they were found unconscious, they could have had a headache first mm -hmm. and then fallen down and hurt themselves versus did they, you know, trip over a rock and fall and hurt so themselves. So it's kind of hard to determine. Yeah. Depending on their con level of consciousness, sometimes they'll say ahead of time, yeah, I kind of had a headache over the last week. Then we can think, okay, maybe this is a, a ruptured aneurysm. And if there's any concern or suspicion that it could be, we always get vascular imaging. Dr. Lawton comes out from the surgery and says that everything went well. And I remember I collapsed. I, I didn't, I was ready to hear the worst outcome. And when he said everything went well, I, I still, I, I still didn't believe it. Um, but in my head, I knew like we're leaving it up to the professionals and uh, it's in their hands and, and she would be fine. And so I'm glad everything turned out well yep. in that sense. But she still gets headaches occasionally. Yeah. And um, I'm just glad we caught it. It was still hard for me to do things like watch TV or have long conversations with the people around me. But the one thing that made me happy were visits from therapy dogs, which would visit once every few days. The few weeks after I came home on Christmas Eve were pretty hard for me because of my headaches. Sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night because of them, or during the day I can't concentrate because the pain gets to me. My body felt weak and tired after I got home from the hospital and my vitamin levels were low. I got dizzy every time I stood up, which still happens, just not as frequently. I think the part that bothered me the most was the memory loss that I experienced. It was almost like I had to reteach myself some of the basic things that used to come easily to me. Sometimes I tell the same story or ask the same question repeatedly without realizing that I already said those things before. In school, I would multiply numbers when I was supposed to add or subtract them because I'd easily get confused. On some of my tests, I'd switch the numbers around or write letters like S and Y backwards. I used to have the stamina to study for hours or read a book without stopping, but now I've gotten used to the fact that I have to take frequent breaks. While I realize my situation could have been a lot worse, I will forever be grateful towards the doctors and nurses that took care of me. The reason why I wanted to share my story with you is to teach people about this problem because 30,000 aneurysms rupture in the US every single year. Anyone with the proper knowledge can make an impact or even save a life. Hi, my name is Todd Helton. We lost our oldest daughter, Ellie, to a ruptured brain aneurysm in July of 2014. It was an aneurysm we didn't even know she had. And as we've learned in the years since, Ellie's story unfortunately is one too commonly told in this community of people. An aneurysm, silently lingering, waiting to rupture, often causing death or disability when it does. That's why research and awareness programs are so vitally important. Research can find solutions through markers and such that can help identify aneurysms in advance of them rupturing. But awareness programs are, so, are equally important because they can educate the public on symptoms and signs of an aneurysm. It arms people with more information to have conversations with doctors about 
the symptoms that they may be experiencing in their lives. We, we didn't know the first thing about aneurysms until Ellie's ruptured. Um, she'd been having headaches and ocular migraines and some things like that that are certainly on the warning sign list for an aneurysm. But they're so rare in teenagers that nobody had really gotten that far down the checklist. Uh, family doctors, whom, whomever we're talking about, to identify that as a possible cause of her symptoms until it was too late, until it ruptured. And so we are involved in this community to help drive awareness, to help drive funding for research, because we think it's so important. You know, we really would like to live in a world where what happened to our family doesn't happen to others. Uh, Ellie was uh, a kind kid, a kind soul. She loved people, had a heart for others. And we honor that through our involvement in this community of people um, in doing what we can to raise awareness, to raise funds for research, uh, so that other families don't have to go through what we've gone through. Hi, my name is Ray Berthelet, and I'm the founder and president of Nolan's Hero Foundation. And I would like to share the story of our son, Nolan. Like many people, we never heard about brain aneurysms. All that changed on the night of July 18th, 2014. Myself, my wife, Amy, and our sons, Nolan and Nason, were getting ready for bed. It was about 10 p.m. Nolan came in and he complained of a very bad headache, followed by his eyes bothering him and nausea. He knew something was wrong and he told us so. We didn't even have time to bring him into the hospital because within a few minutes, he passed out on the bathroom floor and stopped breathing. As my wife was in a panic, she called 911 and tried to calm our youngest son, Nason, who was screaming to not let his brother die. Being CPR certified, I started CPR on my son and did so for 20 minutes until the paramedics arrived and took over. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life, and I've done some pretty difficult things. We had no idea what was happening with Nolan. We rushed to SVH here in Pittsfield, where they worked on Nolan for an hour. They then did a quick MRI and found a brain bleed at the base of his brain. I was standing there and saw the images, and I knew it wasn't good. They life flighted him to Eastern Maine Medical Center in Bangor, where we rushed up there, only to be told by the neurosurgeon that there was nothing that they could do. Nolan was 14 years old. Over the years, there were some minor symptoms, such as a headache, neck pain, blurry vision, or a muscle twitch. These symptoms were always misdiagnosed as something else, and it was never given any thought that it could be a brain aneurysm. If an MRI was done earlier, Nolan may still be alive today. We learned so much about aneurysms and didn't realize how common they really were. We decided to get the entire family tested. All of our tests came back negative, except for my wife. They found a small aneurysm, which she never knew she had. It's very small and they continue to monitor with an MRI every few years. If they're so easy to find with an MRI, then why isn't this done more often when people go for a physical? If found early, it can often be successfully treated, saving many lives. It's amazing that insurance companies won't cover proactive MRIs, but instead end up paying millions in hospital and rehab costs for just one patient. Nolan was an old soul, wise beyond his years, always kind to others, and thought the world had a lot of problems, and he was determined to make this world a better place. He once said, one child alone can make a difference, but all of us together can change the world. He also said, being a hero doesn't take a person that is superior to others or someone with an abnormal power. All it takes is an average human looking to do what is right for others. Both of these quotes are on his gravestone today. During this time, we received a message from Todd Helton, Ellie's father, for who the bill named Ellie's Law was named after. We shared stories and found out that Nolan and Ellie passed away the same week, and they had a lot of similarities. We recently attended the 2023 Brain Aneurysm Foundation Advocacy Day in Washington, D.C. in support of Ellie's Law. We had the pleasure to meet so many brain aneurysm survivors and family members including a young lady named Gia and her mother. We went with them to several representatives and senators' offices in support and to share our story. It's funny to see how things develop and the opportunities that arise with every interaction we make. Everything I just mentioned led us to Gia, who is now doing her own documentary and helping Nolan to spread his message. We are honored to be a part of Gia's documentary and hope our story helps her to raise brain aneurysm awareness. 
This impacts millions of Americans. We need better testing, detection, research, and funding. I never want to see another family go through what we, the Helens or Gia, went through. It can affect anyone, regardless of age, sex, race, or health. If Ellie's Law and a fundamental change in our healthcare system saves even one person, one child, it will be so worth it. I would like to leave you with another quote from Nolan, which he said during his eighth grade graduation speech. Remember the many exciting and unforgettable memories. This is the end of something great and the beginning of something greater. Today is December 20th. We're moving from Milwaukee to California. The movers just came and got the stuff today. And Gia is playing by herself. She just woke up. And I wanted to capture this for her when she grows up. She can see it. Oh, you're so adorable. You know, headaches is something small compared to what she could have been through. And uh, I feel like we're very lucky. We're very grateful. Gia is and, lucky, um, and we are super grateful for everyone who's taking care of Gia. Yeah. And for all the amazing medical technology, medical physicians, and all the nurses, and all the staff that took care of Gia. We are so grateful. Gia came home Christmas Eve. Um, I think it was the best Christmas gift any parent could ever ask for. I agree. Our goal? Yeah. From this uh, documentary, hopefully, is that we can save, or Gia can help save some lives. Please don't ignore a headache. Or ask for that scan. Don't be afraid to ask for that scan. It might just save your kid. An estimated 6.7 million people in the United States have an unruptured brain aneurysm, which is 1 in 50 people. 500,000 deaths are caused worldwide by this condition, and an aneurysm will rupture every 18 minutes in the U.S. There are countless stories of ruptured aneurysm victims who weren't able to make it to the hospital, or patients that suffer from permanent blindness, the loss of speech, or paralysis. Ruptured aneurysms are fatal in around 50% of cases, and of the people who do survive, 66% will suffer from some sort of permanent neurological deficit. The pain that I felt on December 7th was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. While my story started off with something that may have seemed like a virus or a migraine, it was truly beyond a headache.